Okay, we're back. Oh, oh this, is the, this is the first episode, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> so, Timo, who are we? We are Holy Holy. You're Oscar Dawson and I'm Timothy Carroll, so I do the singing in the band. Used to play guitar until we all realised that that wasn't necessary or useful. And you are... You know, producer, composer, like sort of famous for guitar, but also play pretty much everything on the records now. Increasingly, I th- there seem to be m- songs happening where <laughs> in the live show, I don't know what to do because there's not much guitar in them. Yeah, so it started off that I didn't play guitar and, and we're coming for you now. Nah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm next. Okay, where are we? A very special place, actually, which is Eddie's studio. So... You've moved down here to down in the peninsula, you know, crazy brave project of building a studio in in, in the ba- in your own backyard. I almost couldn't imagine that it was going to happen. Really? Well, I mean, it just seemed so incredible. And here we are now sitting in your studio, your very special studio, which is going to be the space where so much incredible music is going to be made. So bands are coming down here and making their records with Oscar as producer. Definitely lifelong a dream to have a studio of my own. I'm um, somewhere where I could record a band, um, not have to go anywhere else to do any recording. Think, thinking about the various studios we've made albums in. Yeah, and we've made music in great places with Matt Redlick at Grandma's Place. You know. and, and some absolute fuckholes as well. Absolute fuckholes, yeah, yeah. Who are we? Where are we? What are we doing? We're almost finished this fifth album and we thought it would be interesting to have some conversations about the record, about us, about some of our collaborators on this record and, we, and this is going to be the first sort of episode of, of those conversations. thought we could start by talking about how we started working together and um, to soundtrack it, it's a thing called The Swedish Tapes. I mean, uh, God, do you know what year would it have been when we first met? Well, I, I know it was a while ago. It was longer than I am willing to admit, I think. Well, but it was just the see. year after finishing school. We didn't know each other. We lived in different cities. I, I lived in Brisbane. You lived in Melbourne. And we both had this idea to go overseas and, and, and do some kind of work. Like a volunteer. Try and save the world, basically. Well, I, I was wide-eyed and uh, grandiose, probably. And so we both ended up in Thailand, of all places, taught English to, like, school kids. And I remember the first time we met, we were both holding nylon string acoustic guitars. Yep. At night, we would, like, drink rum. And I remember, like, lying on the floor, like, sharing a headphone each and listening to, like, Mm. mini discs and Discman, I think. And we we played a lot of guitar. And I always just remember that I loved playing music with you. I remember when, when the trip was over... And we went our separate ways. It was hard because we had lived mm. together like three months or something. And I remember saying goodbye. I was like, oh, man. Yeah. Um, and so then we went back to our own our own cities. Um, yep. And, you know, and life went on. You and I both went on to do our own things musically. You joined the band The Dukes of Windsor. Maybe I was 20 when I joined that band. I, I went to study music at uni because I just wanted to meet people and get involved in the scene whatever that scene was, and then join this band, yeah, Dukes of Windsor. All right, let's... Um, so, which was a bit interesting. How do you feel playing the others? Yeah, go on. I mean, I All feel right. borderline bad about it, actually. <laughs> but. <laughs> oh, shit! Oh. It's so... I, I think it's great. This band released a few things, and then this song, we did a version of this song called The Others, and then it got remixed, and, and, so, uh, and it became a fucking club... Like anthem. <laughs> a memory that I have was you guys had a billboard. <laughs> you guys had a billboard that was like at the local shops just up the road. And I was like, oh, my God. Oscar is a fucking rock star. You know, there's like a phenomenon, I think, where you can go into something so relentlessly, a relationship or a business or a band in this instance, that you'll drown in it. Okay. And I feel like I drowned in this a bit, like... We just went so, I went so hard, it was silly. And I think did a few musical things that I might not have otherwise done. I feel like based on some of the things you've said, you had that kind of experience of the like the major label. Yeah. It, it wasn't good, which is kind of different to like the holy, holy experience. There is one detail there which is um, interesting and pertinent to holy, holy. Our A&R person Aha. was Jess. Beston, who now manages Holy How Holy. How about that? She signed us she, to Universal Music. She was awesome. Uh, the, the problem was the, the band. 
The problem was, was the band. Okay. Yeah. Yep, it really was. Yeah, and and I I take my re- I'm responsible for that too. You know, we just were a dysfunctional bunch of personalities. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So Oscar and I are like barely see each other now because we were just living in different cities yeah, and we're young city. and poor. And, and there was no freaking Instagram or Facebook or like no. keeping up, you know, tabs on each other. Um, meanwhile, I'm like working at the Troubadour in Brisbane, yeah, yeah. which was this music venue. After the venue would close, we'd lock the door and pull the curtain. And a lot of the people who worked there were songwriters. And, um, that sounds heavenly. Oh, it was so <laughs> great. We'd learn each other's songs and we'd sing harmonies on each other's songs. And uh, one of the venue owners, Jamie Travaskis, and he was a producer. And at some point he said to me, let's yeah. make a record together. Yeah. And so I then made this album. So I'm making like the folkiest, most earnest music you can make kind of thing. So that's kind of where things were. I saw you on the MTV Music Awards and I was kicking around wearing like a tartan flat cap and... <laughs> <laughs> so I used to try and tour. I used to go to Melbourne and play like the old bar, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, to yeah, 200 yeah. people. And interestingly, when I was making this record, you came up to Brisbane. I remember. He came along to this session and played guitar on this song. And so this recording, which is a song called Alicia's Song, is, I guess, the first released recording of something that we did together. You, you talk about com- contrasting our experiences, me doing this freaking electro club thing and you doing folky stuff but I think what I was often listening to was you know Fleet Foxes Band of Horses I mean Radiohead which is, isn't folk but you know like oh that's what I was listening to but when you start suddenly find yourself be a bit impressionable and do things that maybe I w- wouldn't have otherwise done yeah like a club remix of a song and, and funnily enough now we are holy holy now in a place where we We'd be quite happy doing probably a, a, club. Club, a club remix. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so each of us having this, these independent careers, blah, blah, blah. I moved to Sweden and you moved to Berlin. With, with Dukes of Windsor. We, we went as a band. And so I'm living in Stockholm in this little apartment and I had this idea that I was going to do, I was going to write and, and, and record and release to my mailing list one song a month for a year. And that would become 12 songs and it would be called the Swedish Tapes. And uh, one day I get this message from Oscar. I'm coming to Stockholm to like get a song mixed. Can I sleep on your couch? And suddenly like there you were in Sweden. And you came up and, and I mm. showed you my recording stuff. And, and like pretty, pretty immediately I was like, oh, this is a song I'm working on. And you pretty much just took over <laughs> the like production. Yeah, you had your, like, I guess it was a laptop. Yeah, it would have been. I have a feeling that by this point, Dukes of Windsor might have broken up. And yep. so we'd gone through this whole process of c- the band kind of collapsing it imploding upon itself so i think going to sweden was like a a bit of a escape making music with an old friend um but a new spirit was uh particularly exciting and so the first song we worked on i think was this song slow melody yeah i really like this song actually it helped me record it. We had a little. We were using like synthesizers on on iPhones. You were playing synth on iPhone. Wait, wait, really, I don't remember that. Okay, um, cool. And so then started happening. I would like write a couple of songs on my acoustic guitar, and once I had enough, I would fly to Berlin. Yeah, yeah. Cheap, super cheap. And then we would have these these weeks in Berlin, like riding our bikes around Berlin, smoking weed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Recording. These demos, all these demos. As a result of this project, you and I ended up writing basically an album. Yeah. And then and then we got back to Australia and I, I had this Timothy Carroll thing and you were working on various projects. You were working yeah. on a project with your wife, Ali Bada. Yeah, yeah, because at that point she was not even my girlfriend. She was just That's a collaborator. Right. That's that right. That I um, eventually figured, well, figured out what was going on. I spoke to a producer, a guy called Matt Redlick from Brisbane, and was like, got these songs, want to make a record. So at this point, we've got like no manager, no label, yep. no band name, no fucking idea about how anything works. And it was Timothy Carroll. It was a, it was your it was your sort of solo project. I guess it was really yeah. And I was just in back in Melbourne. I think by that point, kind of licking my wounds, breaking up with that band, and questioning whether music was even a viable pathway <laughs> yeah um, and, and then then yeah you're right I did meet Ali there and that kind of put a pep in my step definitely the idea of like being a musician as a job was something that I never dared to dream was yeah, possible yeah sure anyway we started going to these sessions um at Matt Redlick studio in East Brisbane to make our first record which would end up being called When the Storms Would Come I don't remember whose idea it was 
but we were like, we're going to record it to tape. We, we didn't even have enough money to buy the rolls of tape. Yeah. Like, it'd be like, okay, fuck, well, there's seven minutes left, okay, so we got one more take and that's it kind of thing. And, and he'd have a few rolls there, wouldn't he? And he'd be like, okay, we can do this other song, but you're going to have to tape over something else yeah, so, so, we, have to, so, we have to lose something so he had just recorded records with Ballpark Music and Emma Louise and I remember we were like recording over the tapes of of Ballpark Music and Emma Louise records wow like oftentimes you do the whole band and then the vocal would you do separately and you get this really liquidy live sounding organic sounding record and, and the band was good the band remains good but like it's Ryan on drums and Joe on, on bass, who, who we don't play with now, but we play with another bass player, Graham Ritchie, who's amazing. But um, Joe and Ryan was so easy to play with. I had taken some time off from social work to, to go to the studio. I really felt like I was becoming a different person, like working in this office and wearing office clothes and things like that. It just wasn't for me. I got a sync as well. I got a sync off um, one of those songs off that first record with the city of Townsville or something. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that I think happening. it was 40 grand. Yeah, wow. And, yeah. and I was like, I'm quitting my job. Yeah, I mean, I think that was that was the right choice, probably, I think. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, never, I felt so much more myself. Every time I feel like, you know, the wind's fully going to leave my sails and I need to go and get a proper job or something, something happens and you get a little breeze from somewhere. And so months went by, like, again, like, still no record label, still no management. We're just making an album. And then found Jess Beston, who had been your A&R agent at, at Universal with yep. Dukes of Windsor. Yeah. And she kind of listened to the songs and we started working with her and we started working with Wonderlick, yeah. um, a record label that we're still with. Around that time, I guess, like, okay, what, what is this project going to be? And it was like, is it going to be a Timothy Carroll record? And, and I didn't really want it to be that. I kind of wanted it to be something with you. Okay. Do you remember in the studio we were recording and they had a light box? Yeah. I remember like in one of the sessions I put Holy Holy on the light box. Like using the letters on the yeah. box. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let's just like, just to see what it's like. And Live I remember talking to a few people about the band name and everyone was like, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I remember a few people were like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Like, yeah, you could do that. The only downside to the band name is that people sometimes think we are a Christian, Christian rock, rock band. band. Yeah, well, especially in the early days. No doubt there are some people who have no idea who we are who might hear it and think we are. Christian, um, but uh, tisn't. <laughs> so. the case. Yeah, we formed. Yeah, well, impossible like you. That was a, a, a moment that the yeah, kind of identity of the band started kind of germinating. Was, and this was like the first release that Holy Holy ever made, and the first song that we ever had like played on radio yeah. and everything. Did a couple of things there as the identity of the band was kind of emerging. It wasn't like we said. Let's start a band. It, it sort of it did emerge in a fairly natural way, and it almost got to the point where even I was like, "Oh God, fuck! Can I do another band?" You know, like I felt jaded, I suppose, by some of those earlier musical uh, experiences. My faith was tested in music, but I'm glad to be feeling good about it again. You know. By then, we had like a manager in Jess Beston, yep. a record label with Wonderlick, a band name which was Holy Holy. And maybe the beginnings of a sound, that was how Holy Holy was found. But really, like, the truth and the nuance of it is, is that. That's the yeah, story yeah. of how the band started. That sounds, it actually sounds super accurate, and that's how my memory is of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's been, a, it's, it's been the, the band's been, like, a great honour and a privilege to be a part of, and, and to have music out in, in, in the global and Australian music scene has been, like, you know, one of the great honours of our lives. So, yeah, um, yeah, definitely, definitely. We look forward to talking more with you and um, we'll see you next time. Yeah, that's nice. That was good.